Hi there, so uh, welcome to lecture four. Um, lecture four is the last in the sort of introductory set of uh, my lectures, David Dye's lectures, on MSE 307 Engineering Alloys. And here, just before we get going into titanium proper, um, for my set on titanium, we're going to have a bit of a think about the theory of alloying. That is, uh, there's a lot of underlying theoretical ideas for metal physics that we can use and that we do use when we're thinking about how to develop alloys and how alloying works. And uh, so we're just going to spend a bit of time thinking about that. And this, compared to the previous three lectures, which were quite phenomenological, we were describing phenomena and thinking about it, th so that was a lot of stuff, um, but not so much hard intellectual work. This is probably the hardest intellectual work we'll do in my eight lectures. Um, and what I really want to do here is expose you to that world just to let you know that it's there, really, more than anything else, and to give you some things to hang on to think about um, as we go through. And it will help also with um, particularly the nickel alloy lectures, uh, the aluminium alloy lectures as well, and maybe even the carbide stuff in steels. So uh, here we go. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is uh, look at a guy called Hume Rothery. Um, and Hume Rothery is interesting. Um, he was a fellow of the Royal Society, he was an OBE. Um, he was the um, founding, uh, uh, one of the founders of the Department of uh, Metallurgy, as it was, now Materials, in Oxford uh, in the 50s. He, his PhD actually was here in the Royal School of Mines, um, and his undergraduate degree was in Oxford in chemistry. And at that time in Oxford, material science, metallurgy didn't exist. Um, so being interested in uh, metals in particular, he came from chemistry to a mining department, as this was then, a metallurgy department, um, so the sort of blacksmithing end of the subject, and was part of the invention of modern material science, which was really a, a post-war thing that came out of physics and chemistry and metallurgy together. Um, that revolutionized, it was the material science revolution, revolutionized uh, metallurgy and gave us modern material science and engineering departments, of which, you know, this is one, Oxford is one, everybody's at that now. Um, and so, uh, you know, we expect great things of our of our graduates. Uh, we expect them to go and found other university departments. Um, you know, the whole gamut of things. And Hume Rothery uh, came up with a set of rules called the Hume Rothery rules. Um, and these were um, empirical ideas based upon some physical concepts and some observations of how alloying seemed to work. Um, and so his rules are that um, solid solutions can form substitutional solid solutions. So that's atoms of similar size going on the same lattice. Um, so say putting cobalt into an iron lattice or something like that, or a nickel lattice. Substitutional solid solutions will form between two species, two atomic species, if their atomic radii differ by a small amount, less than 15%. If their crystal structures are the same, so isolated, say, nickel um, forms a, an FCC structure, it would form uh, a solution it with another atom of similar size with us that also fa formed an FCC structure. And that complete solubility could occur if the valency was the same. Now, okay, valency is a um, sort of fuzzy concept, but um, it's the simplest of bo atomic bonding concepts. How many outer shell electrons do you have? to play with, to bond with another, uh, another atom. Um, so generally, a metal will dissolve another uh, of higher valency more easily than one of lower valency. So titanium is 4 plus. Um, so iron would dissolve titanium more easily than titanium would dissolve iron in a solution. And uh, here, so we're thinking about solute and solvents. So the solvent is the bath. So say, if we've got a bath of, of nickel, that would be the solvent. And if we're putting cobalt into it, then cobalt would be the solute. Um, and they should have similar electronegativity, the um, energy uh, of the outer shell. Um, so here's uh, the periodic table cut down just to think about the most commonly interesting elements for metallurgy, coloured by their crystal structure that they form as uh, isolated, uh, pure species. So for instance, cobalt here um, is FCC at low temperatures. It's 
can also be HTTP sometimes, but let's not get into that. Nichols FCC, Copper's FCC. Then you see the, the, the ones in the row below and the row below um, going down through, uh, through the periodic table. They are um, uh, also FCC. As we come over here, we get to metals, titanium, zirconium, hafnium that are hexagonal. Um, and in between there are these guys that are BCC, and then these guys that are kind of confused, the iron and magnes notice are magnetic, and that messes with things. Iron's BCC at room temperature, but FCC at elevated temperatures, and BCC again at very high temperatures. Um, and that's all to do with the magnetism, really. Um, these guys, technetium, ruthenium, rhenium, osmium, they're obscure, to be honest. Um, uh, osmium in particular is very obscure. Um, technetium is very obscure because it's not naturally occurring. Um, and uh, then we have the alkali metals over here. Um, lithium, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium. Uh, you know, the other guys we don't tend to alloy with, but we certainly alloy with uh, uh, beryllium, lithium, mag magnesium. Um, and then there's these guys over here, aluminium, silicon. So aluminium's just next to the semiconductors. Silicon, germanium, ooh, interesting. Um, so it's not a transition metal like all the others. Um, and then we have things that are phosphor and sulfur I've put in because they're contaminants. Um, go to grain boundaries. We have um, the uh, gases, so carbon and nitrogen, um, very good interstitial strengtheners. Boron notice is there. Oh, then boron's interesting, sort of semi metallic, weird. Um, and then uh, we have oxygen, of course, forming oxides, but also in solution. Helium bubbles in irradiated materials. Hydrogen over there giving us corrosion problems and embrittlement. And th so that's those are interesting uh, metals. So immediately, if we're think saying things want to be the same crystal structure, then we're saying these guys would dissolve each other very nicely. Um, titanium and zirconium would dissolve each other very nicely. But uh, say cobalt and chromium or nickel and chromium might have problems. Um, so that's sort of the, the sort of first insight. And we'll look at some phase diagrams and see if this is true. Um, here's a chart that shows the atomic radii for the different long periods. So uh, our, our top row there, uh, you know, you go calcium, sc scandium, titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, gallium, germanium, arsenic, selenium, I think. And you, this is a plot of their sizes. And they tend to follow this sort of a trend as you go across. So the middle of the transition element block there are the smallest ones. Um, you have some issues there with manganese with different states, iron with different states. And that's the interatomic radius based on uh, taking the lattice parameter of the solid uh, and then assuming it's a hard sphere model um, uh, in the packing, working out what the interatomic radius would be. Um, and uh, then and there the uh, different symbols used, if we look down here in the notes, uh, tell you the crystal structure. So um, your body-centered cubics here are the boxes. Um, your FCC atoms are the, are the black circles. Um, and your hexagonal um, ones are the, are the round circles. So titanium's there, um, zirconium's there. Um, zirconium also has a high temperature BCC phase, which is there. Right, so that's the alpha and beta phases of zirconium. Um, and then there's the rare earths, of course, they're a bit strange. And then you come over to the bottom row here. And that's, that's interesting. That implies, OK, so if I take nickel here, nickel might bond well <laughs> with another FCC of a similar size. So you could probably get some palladium in, for instance. Um, palladium is a heavier element, so that they tend to be a bit bigger, tend to be a bit bigger again as you go down the row, go down the periods. Um, and uh, so that's, that sort of shows you what's going on. Um, shows you, for instance, carbon's not going to dissolve very well in anything, um, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's an interesting way of doing it. Another way to look at it is, let's look at a few cases. Let's look at the, the top row of the first period here um, and have a look at them. So here's uh, iron, and iron, as you basically, as you go away from iron here, then in its FCC state, as you go away, then the size difference gets bigger, roughly speaking. OK, so here's the gradient of the solidus and liquidus lines for titanium 
in a solution of iron. So titanium in a solution of iron, if you were solidifying an alloy of 5% titanium, it would hit its liquidus line here, hit solidus line somewhere down here. Um, and that gradient is quite large because titanium doesn't want to alloy very well with iron. Um, the gradient would be shallow if it uh, alloyed easily. That is, you wouldn't have a big depression of the melting point. Uh, you would have a much greater solubility. You'd, this would extend out further. So um, if we go and look at something like cobalt here, cobalt has a very shallow gradient and has a relatively, also a relatively um, small melting interval between the liquidus and solidus, and you can get a lot of it dissolved in. So when you're just adjacent, you have a shallow gradient. When you're a long way away, you have a steep gradient and less solubility. So um, as you go closer, you go titanium, vanadium, chromium. Um, and then as you go away, so start from copper, you have copper, nickel, cobalt. Okay? The exception there is manganese, because they're both both iron and manganese are funny and magnetic. Okay. So as a empirical rule, it seems to be somewhat useful. It's not perfect, but it's somewhat useful as a way of looking at alloying and why phase diagrams are the way they are. So Heemrother, we also looked at uh, interstitial atoms and what they do. Um, so uh, having considered, considered um, atoms that were substitutional on the lattice, he thought about ones that would be interstitial, that would be small enough to fit in the holes in the, the interstitial holes in the lattice. So that's primarily hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, boron, um, the smallest ones. Um, and he, you can calculate, of course, the size of the interstitial site, just do a bit of geometry. Um, and his first postulate was that uh, the solute atoms, therefore, must fit in the, to the interstitial site if they're going to not expand things and cause problems in the lattice. And his uh, second comment was that the solute and solvent should have similar electronegativity. So that is, hydrogen tends to fit quite easily in lots of things. You have lots of solubility for hydrogen in many metals, um, whereas uh, you might not necessarily for a, a bigger atom. So if we come back to our chart of atomic sizes, um, uh, hydrogen's not on my chart, um, but uh, if you come and look at... Um, no, it's not on my chart, so it's not going to work. Um, but in general, you can go and find the sizes and go and check. Um, so let's look at a, a system where this works nicely. So titanium and niobium. Titanium and niobium um, are, are in very close to each other in the periodic table. So let's just, just flick back to the... Um, so titanium's here, niobium's there. Um, in terms of size, they're the wrong crystal structure, but titanium is there, and niobium is there. They're actually quite similar sizes. Um, and what we see quite nicely is that you have a broad solubility between titanium and niobium. Uh, you're, you can have complete solubility in the solid. Um, when you get down to the allotropic transformation in titanium, then you're hexagonal um, trying to go with the BCC. Then it doesn't ha work very well. But when titanium is in its BCC high temperature state, you have complete solubility. So that's quite nice. BCC tie can dissolve an IBM completely because they're the same size and the same crystal structure. And HCP titanium does not. So that's kind of cool. Um, titanium and zirconium, one above the other, S same place but different periods. Um, so very similar uh, in terms of atomic size, same crystal structure, similar electronegativity. Here, they both have a low temperature hexagonal phase. They both have a high temperature BCC phase, both of which can dissolve each other completely. Um, and therefore, you have continuous solubility for both. Um, and that's, that's very nice. Um, and actually, uh, there's some fun stuff if you're doing neutron scattering. Uh, titanium has a negative scattering length for neutrons, which is sort of strange. Um, and zirconium has a positive scattering length. So you can make an alloy of the two that has zero scattering length. And that uh, means that they have no uh, elastic scattering peaks in neutron diffraction. So you can make a null scatter scattering alloy. It still ha has um, non-elastic scattering, inelastic scattering. So you still get some incoherent background. But if you want to make a, a sample cell um, to hold a crystal in a neutron diffractometer and you don't want it getting in the way and producing extra peaks, well, you can make the titanium zirconium alloy because uh, they have continuous solubility that um, doesn't scatter at all. It's very nice. Um, so here's an example where you're in trouble. Aluminium, magnesium, neither of them being transition metals. Um, so everything's crazy. 
Um, and although they have similar sizes, um, then here you're really in trouble. So let's just, just go back again, uh, look at our periodic table. So magnesium here is HCP, aluminum is FCC. They're yeah, similar structures. They're both close pack layer structures. Okay. Um, but uh, when we look at the phase diagram, the nice thing is aluminium has, uh, magnesium is interesting because it's the thing that has most solubility of all the transition metals, all the metals, sorry, magnesium is not a transition metal, but of all the metals in aluminium. But its solubility is still quite restricted. Um, but they're not the same crystal structure, right? So the weird thing is, hemothery would say they shouldn't dissolve each other very well, but they do, in fact. Um, and the same is true for aluminium and magnesium. And um, we see there's a, a bunch of funny intermetallics here in between um, that uh, generally mean making a, a high magnesium content aluminium alloy is difficult or vice versa. Um, but you can, you can have quite a bit. You can have quite a bit. And you can uh, use this. You can put in uh, some magnesium. You can have some solid solution strengthening and then form some precipitates, um, which may or may not be useful to you in strengthening. Um, here's a, a system that works quite nicely. Um, nickel and cobalt, of course, next to each other, both FCC in the right circumstances, um, so they will dissolve each other completely. Chromium, not the same crystal structure, and therefore um, it has quite a bit of solubility, but therefore uh, you don't actually get um, uh, complete solubility. Instead, here you have a two-phase region between pure chrome and the FCC phase. So if you're an alloy here, you'd have FCC, nickel, cobalt, and chrome. Um, and there's also some sigma phases here that are, um, again, nasty intermetallics that tend to be in brittle again, nickel superalloys. So if you're making a nickel superalloy, you can get up to this sort of content, 40 odd percent chrome um, in atomic. Um, sorry, I need to read it the other way. If I go, it's that way. <laughs> um, but I can get to up to quite a, quite a bit of chrome um, before I start getting in trouble. Um, of course, you need to go like that. Um, and. Uh, Here's a, 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 an even funnier ternary phase diagram. Um, titanium, aluminium, and nickel, if you look at them, they're in three totally different parts of the periodic table. Nickel's FCC, titanium's HCP, aluminium's FCC, but it's not really a proper metal. At least it, mean it is, but it's not a transition metal. Um, and here, well, they've got, aluminium's got very little solubility for either of those. Titanium's got a bit for aluminium, quite a bit, you know, nearly 10%, but not a huge amount for nickel only a couple of percent, and there are one, two, three, four, five. Uh, see if you can scratch more. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen different intermetallic phases in the system, um, many of which are quite good fun. So uh, TIAL um, is, is useful, TI3AL is useful, uh, NIL, NI3L are useful phases. Um, and there are even here some of these guys here that will be very interesting phases. Um, and that's uh, a system where you get lots of intermetallics because they won't dissolve each other very well in exactly the way Hemothery predicted. So another phenomenon you've met, and we met this back actually in my first year lectures, was Vegard's law. Um, I call it, it's not a law in the sense of a physical law with a, a, a solid physical basis. It's an observation. Um, and Vegard observed that the lattice parameter and the solute content were usually linearly related. That is, if you get a small atom and put it in uh, a lattice with, with a bigger atom, um, then it will tend to reduce the average um, dimension of the lattice, the average lattice parameter, and therefore the, um, the lattice parameter would go down the more of it you had in there, and vice versa if you had a bigger atom going into the, into the lattice. Um, so here's uh, iron with more and more aluminium in um, and its lattice parameter. And as you add aluminium, then you increase the lattice parameter. Um, and it's an approximate empirical rule. Okay? Now, there are situations where it might not work. You know, immediately, if you think of an interstitial atom that's smaller than the uh, hole it's going into, then it might not change the lattice parameter at all. Right? Um, so, uh, or it might. I mean, uh, bonding is complicated. But as a, l as a rule, it's quite nice. Um, so that brings us on to think about how we use this, these two things, 
Kim Rotherwee's rules about uh, forming solutions and Vagard's law for solution strengthening. So in 203, we found that um, for substitutional solutes, the increase in strength from um, substitutional solute solution strengthening would go with the shear modulus times the difference in lattice parameter, the strain given, delta squared, um, times constant. And for um, interstitial solutes, then it would be 3g times delta, um, uh, sorry, it's the same delta, it's a typo in the slide, uh, for interstitial solutes. So if there's a mismatch size limit because of on the grounds of solubility, um, so the solubility decreases the m more the change in last parameter per unit amount of solute. Delta, remember, is the change per unit amount of solute. So if that's big, you'll also therefore have a large size difference, so a limited solubility. So if you have a very different size atom, you get a lot of solid solution strengthening per atomic percent of it, but you can only have so much of it in there. So um, if you look here, then copper's very close. Copper gives you, um, sorry, copper's a couple of atoms away from iron. Um, and this is for steels. And so, and but then if you come across to nickel, nickel has much less effect because its last parameter difference is much less. You can get more nickel in, but of course its effect is less. So there's sort of a physical limit there that uh, you can use something with a big size difference, but you can't get much of it in. Or you can use something with a smaller size difference, which won't be as effective in solution strengthening and have more of it. In total, what that means is there'll be a limit to how much strength benefit you can get from solution strengthening. The uh, exception to that is the, the interstitial uh, elements here. They're very effective, but you have very little solubility for them. Um, you have some, but not an enormous amount. So they're amazing solution strengtheners. Interstitial solution strengthening is great, but you can't get very much of it in. So solution strengthening has definite limits on how much it can give us in terms of strength in an alloy. Um, so titanium, pure, commercially pure titanium, you quite often use oxygen as a solid solution strengthener there. And that can increase its strength quite dramatically for pure tie from you know, 150 MPa to 450 MPa but it's not going to give you much more than that 300 MPa. Once you start adding in other strengthening, uh, grain size, um, precipitate strengthening, um, then uh, you, know, you get to a, a really strong alloy. Probably solution strengthening from oxygen only gives you 100 MPa or something before uh, you start running into trouble with things like brittleness and so on, um, and before you start um, you know, just reaching the limit of the amount of solute you can get in there. Um, so... Uh, that takes you on to wanting to use precipitates. Um, and uh, there are quite a lot of precipitates um, which have an L12 structure that we use in alloying. Um, the L12 structure is a primitive cubic uh, lattice um, for a compound with a, um, uh, that is of the type A3X, where A and X are the two um, two atoms that are going in there, so Ni3Al, CO3Ti, Al3 lithium, Al3 scandium, uh, cobalt-3, aluminium tungsten. Aluminium tungsten, it turns out, has the same lattice parameter, um, same atomic size, sorry. So they uh, go together very nicely, actually. Um, and so here, for Ni3Al, this is a sketch of Ni3Al, if you take, uh, if you disorder it fully, you have FCC nickel. If you order it, then you put the nickel atoms on uh, the face centers of the cube and the aluminium atoms on the corners. So they've effectively formed two interpenetrating lattices, two sublattices. Um, and uh, here, uh, these two actually, this can disorder into this phase. So um, uh, if you're in the right circumstance in the right alloy. Um, so uh, here you can form this out of nickel, and this has a very similar lattice parameter to its disordered cousin. Um, and that means that you have uh, quite a small misfit between the two, um, which means you don't have a lot of surface energy. It means it's easy to nucleate them, uh, it's easy to grow them, uh, it means that uh, you 
can push dislocations through them as well um, because you've got a, a relationship between the dislocation here and the full dislocation there. This half 110 dislocation is a partial in the ordered structure. Um, and so that you can make small precipitates that are the right size to maximize strength from cutting and bowing. Um, so these sorts of um, coherent precipitates, ones that form coherently um, with very little size mismatch, um, no defects in the interface, um, are very, very nice and very commonly used for strengthening bow lines. So just to show you some examples, um, this is actually the cobalt-3 aluminum tungsten system. Um, and here's some cobalt-9 aluminum-9 tungsten alloys. Um, this is uh, etched, so you've got some, some big cubes here. There, sorry about the scale bar, but they are on the order of 150, 200 nanometers in size. And there are some very small guys in between that are on the order of 10 nanometers in size. The inset diffraction pattern shows you, uh, here's the SCC, and you can see all the primitive cubic spots from the gamma prime in between. This uh, precipitate called gamma prime. Um, and uh, then when you push dislocations that are in the, the, in the gamma matrix through, they tend to go through in pairs I'm giving you a very beautiful TEM micrograph. Um, um, so that is, you, you're taking your two partials, dislocations, and putting them through together. Um, and they have antiphase boundaries in between them, as you've studied before. Um, so that's a very nice system. And, and the, the nice thing is, of course, is that you've only got a half percent or so um, lattice parameter difference between the gamma and the gamma prime. So this interface is coherent. Um, so. These are examples of super lattice structures, so structures that are composed of two or maybe even three interpenetrating lattices. So that is, if you've got a, a, a compound A3B, this happens when your A and B atoms don't like each other. Um, uh, that is, uh, you want to form AB bonds rather than AA bonds and BB bonds. Um, and uh, that's when ionic bonding is involved to an extent. They have different electronegativities. Um, and when A and B are different in size, but not so different that the solution is impossible um, because you want them to all be in solution at the high temperature state. Um, so you can precipitate out small ones. Um, also in the high temperature state, you tend to make it forgeable, which is uh, nice if you need to be able to do that. Um, here's another example where you can have three sublattices. Um, and these are uh, intermetallics based on three sublattices. They tend to be based on the FCC structure. So here we've got a light blue that's on the middles of the uh, uh, here, so on the middles of the sides there, and then middles of the sides there, and consequently the other way around, the axis. You've got uh, some uh, another structure here, which is the the Ys which are in orange, and the Zs, uh, which are in pink. Um, and the, uh, the Heusler phases are um, good fun. Um, they may be interesting for strengthening. Um, they're also interesting uh, magnetic materials quite often, so things like nickel-2, manganese, gallium, um, where the nickel's the blue and the manganese and the gallium are the purple and the orange. Um, and uh, they can be good for making functional shape memory alloys, actually. Um, that is, shape memory alloys that change in response to a, uh, an electric or a, a, a magnetic field. Um, but it doesn't seem to be possible to form more than three sublattices. Presumably, it's too difficult for the atoms to jump up and order together to form the, the, the more than three sublattices. So this is the uh, empirically observed physical limit of having three sublattices in your structure. So that takes you down the road of saying, well, what if I take five elements, say, that don't want to form solutions with each other. They can't form five different sublattices. So what do they do? And the argument goes that they will just form one big sort of FCC-ish kind of amalgam, um, which is uh, uh, then called a high entropy alloy. Um, but you also see in the metallic glass community that if you have five different atoms that don't want to form solutions with each other, they will tend to f form metallic glasses more easily. Um, and so most metallic glasses are formed of five dissimilar elements that uh, don't dissolve each other. 
um, but will do up in the liquid. That's what I mean by that. They, may, they will do up in the liquid, and then you quench it. And it, they won't form crystal structures because they don't know how to form five sublattices, so they just stay in a glassy sort of state. That's the argument. Um, so coming back to our L12s, then from 203, I just recall that for coherency strengthening for cutting, then you have this change in strength is related by this equation. It goes to the square root of R times 2. K is a constant strain. Is that's the misfit strain, the coherency strain between the two phases. G is the shear modulus, B is the Berger factor, F the fraction. Um, if you were doing uh, cutting with a, uh, and you were considering the strengthening effect to be the antiphase boundary energy, so you were taking two partials in the FCC, uh, two FCC dislocations, and they were partials in the uh, ordered structure, then those partials would then have a, an antiphase domain in between them, or antiphase boundary, and that would have an energy of gamma. And we'll come and look at it in a second. Um, and the strength would then go square root of r times gamma cubed instead of strain cubed. It's otherwise a similar sort of form formalism. Um, the Burgers vector is more involved. Burger bowing, on the other hand, bowing around the precipitate only depends on the strength to break the dislocation in the matrix. So there it goes with the spacing, 1 over r times the fraction um, and times constant root 3 over 2 pi. Um, and so your bowing does something like that. The dislocation is bypassing um, the precipitates and then shearing or cutting the precipitates here. And you'll take the easiest way around, right? So if you have very small particles, the bowing strength would be enormous, so it's easy just to cut them. And if you're over here, um, then the cutting strength is now enormous, uh, but you can bypass them and go around them. So if they're bigger, they'll be further spaced apart. So there is some maxima here where uh, you will get the maximum amount of precipitation strengthening, so you'd aim to age your precipitates until they were at that maximum strength. Very nice. So just to show you a picture of what APB hardening looks like, um, you've got two partials here that are, are in principle, it's a bit more complicated than this in reality, which Dr. Veronso will talk about, but for uh, nickel superalloys, uh, you, you could imagine that they might be half 110 dislocations. When they then enter the precipitate, you'd form an antiphase boundary between them, um, and uh, where you don't have the right packing here. And just to illustrate that, here you've got a dislocation. Here you're in your, this is if you just have a, a, a 2D lattice of red and white atoms. Um, and here you've got them uh, a, a nice structure. And when you pass this dislocation through, as you go, it's like you move all these guys over, you've got an extra half plane of atoms. Um, it's not really an extra half plane, it's a line defect, but nevertheless. And what that does is it makes some red-red bonds. Um, so I'm, I'm fine here, now I've got a white-white, now I've got a red-red, red-red, red-red. Up here and up here, it will still be fine, you'll still be, but here you have lots of undesired red-red and white-white bonds, and that's called an antiphase boundary. Um, so uh, if you then passed another dislocation through, you'd undo that, so these dislocations tend to travel in pairs, um, leading and trailing partial dislocations. Um, so uh, that's how APB hardening works. You can also have just um, uh, coherency strengthening. Here are uh, gamma prime particles, as it turns out, they're still in an austenitic steel. Um, and superalloys actually developed from steels, from stainless steels, that is FCC steels with a lot of nickel and chrome in. Um, and they form as disks in this particular alloy. And so you're seeing them there, and you're also seeing them side on, because uh, they have a cube-cube orientation relationship. So there's some side on there um, as well. And uh, they're actually being decorated. What you're seeing is um, sometimes, if I find the right example, um, is uh, you can see the dislocations looping around them. You can see one around there. Uh, you can see, uh, where is it? You can sort of see one around there. Uh, but you can see the dislocations looping around them. Um, so when your dislocation has gone through, it's um, broken and reformed by R and bypass, it will leave a loop around the dislocation, which actually you'll tend to see, there's one, in TEM. Um, 
And that's uh, when you just, in this particular system, you just have a misfit, you just have coherency strengthening. There's no APB hardening here. Um, and uh, then it's less effective. Uh, so if I come back to my strengthening mechanisms, um, in principle, you'd have both of these going on. Um, but if you have APB hardening, that would be the, the, the bigger effect. Um, but if you don't have APBs, you might well just have coherency strengthening. Um, so a couple of things to think about. Another thing to think about here is um, in NITI, shape memory alloy, here we have a high temperature B2 phase, nickel and titanium on two interpenetrating lattices. The B2 phase is based on uh, BCC. So it's like you've got nickel on the corners and titanium in the middle of the, cu uh, middle of the cube. Um, so uh, here's a, a, a BCC cube. Um, and uh, if we go in here, it gets kind of hard to see. Um, but uh, you can see how they would form if you look at it, stare at it long enough. Um, the B2 lattice here doesn't have its atoms on. It's the atoms are just for the B19 prime lattice. Um, and at low temperatures, what happens to nitite is it goes through a phase transformation to a B19 or a B19 prime phase. And the B19 phase is an orthorhombic version. So if I watch the gray, I'd form it from out of there and down to there. No, it's just down one. There, 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 there. And being one box high. Um, and that's the orthorhombic version. And the B19 monoclinic version is sheared over by a bit, something like nine degrees, typically. Um, and so it's a symmetrically related phase to the parent B2, and so it can form martensitically um, without, that is, without any reconstructive transformation, just by um, moving the atoms slightly. So uh, the B19 phase doesn't fit quite right, so you have a bit of a stretch that way, a bit of a stretch that way, a bit of a contraction that way. Uh, and the B19 prime is then an additional shear strain applied to that lattice. And the problem there is that in doing that, when you're halfway through transformation, you'll have B19 prime with a big strain that it's imposing as it changes shape on the surrounding B2 matrix. And that may be quite a large strain, it, um, and you can't accommodate that properly. Um, so what do you do? Um, Tony uh, Paxton will talk about this when he talks about Martin Sites in Steels. What you can do is you can accommodate some of that by putting another material in as, and form them in twin related pairs. So some B19 prime forms one way and some forms the other way. And s uh, the two, uh, two strains net cancel out to some extent and therefore uh, you don't put so much strain into the surrounding material. You don't have to put so much elastic strain energy in and therefore it's easier to form um, so therefore, if it's easy to form, that tends to be the favoured thing. It's all some dynamics um, at the end of the day. So if you have a lot of strain associated with this transformation, that will tend to inhibit the transformation. Um, the other thing is it will tend to give you lattice defects like dislocations at the interface between the two phases if the strain is too big. And those defects will then um, stop the, bat the interfaces moving so easily and growing so easily um, and may therefore give rise to a hysteresis in the transformation. So um, here's a, a chart. This is a, a nickel titanium alloy with some hafnium in that's a high temperature shape memory alloy. Um, and as you, uh, if you start off in the high temperature B2 phase, you cool down, you cool down, and you transform to the B19 prime. This is on repeated cycling, so cycles one, two, and five. Um, so cycle one's the dark blue. Then when you heat up, um, then you heat up and you go back, but you go back at a higher temperature now. And you've got something like a 50 degree difference in the transformation temperatures there. And when you cool down, you tr then cool down, you've now got some lattice defect at a lower temperature. That is, you need to have more driving force for it to go. That hysteresis tends to stay the same. But so you see the transformation temperatures drift on repeated cycling. And if you're trying to make a device out of this, this is a real pain because your device isn't stable. As you cycle it, its transformation temperatures change. So the temperature at which it operates uh, is a problem. So you would aim to do something like make a thermostatic shower valve or a, uh, a morphing wing 
out of night eye as the actuator. You just heat it up and it changes shape. Um, but the problem is, is that uh, the transformations have to change every time, so your morphing wing doesn't morph properly or more predictably anymore. So you want to get rid of this hysteresis that will stop the drift due to the lattice defects, and also then you'll have a, a, a much narrower window, which might, or depending on what you're trying to do, be a handy thing. And uh, the um, uh, if you go and look at what the strains are associated with this transformation, actually you can decompose them into their principal components. Let's find the eigenvalues of the distortion tensor. Um, and the middle eigenvalue, uh, the one near closest to one, uh, is the critical thing for the interface plane, which you'll again look at with Tony Paxton and Martin's slide. Um, and here's a plot of that middle eigenvalue, how it changes with composition for um, what the effect of it is on the hysteresis. And as you, uh, for nitide palladium alloys, as you change the palladium content, you gradually change the middle eigenvalue and, uh, and increase it, well, or decrease it, depending on which way around you're going. But as you get to the lowest the value of the middle eigenvalue closest to one, you minimize the hysteresis. And the same is true for nitide copper, nitide platinum, and so on. So this is a... a, a a science paper of the mid 2000s um, by R.D. James and co-workers that gives you a, a way of trying to minimize this hysteresis by looking at minimizing uh, the lattice parameter difference between the two phases in effect, that's what the eigenvalue is going to be, uh, which you can do with a Vagard's law type approach. So Vagard's law helps us today in the mid 2000s design better shape memory alloys, which is really cool. Um, that's a real example. Um, changing from lattice parameters, another big thing that's important that we can affect by alloying to some extent are the elastic constants. Um, and uh, um, in uh, titanium alloys, this modulus, the difference between C11 and C12, you can change by adding vanadium. So titanium is up here, and as you add vanadium, you decrease the electron per atom ratio, the average number of electrons in the outer shell. Uh, this is based on some averaging uh, idea. It's not the, the, the real solid state physics hasn't been done. This is based on averaging. Um, and, um, well, it's an embedded atom potential model by uh, Dal Kajan and co workers at Berkeley, Bill Morris. Um, and uh, this is experimental data. Here are some alloys uh, gum metal um, and uh, uh, TVZO. And here's actually the beta phase in the TIE 64 alloy. And what you find is that as you alloy it, then you decrease, as you increase alloy contents going that way, then you decrease this number, C111 minus C12. And the 110110 shear modulus is given by C prime, which is a half C11 minus C12, uh, which we did actually in a problem in 203. So that's the shear modulus on the 111 uh, on the 110 plane in the 110 direction, um, and uh, you can prove that to yourself by trying to do a shear test on a uh, cubic crystal uh, in its 110 plane, rotating in a circle, um, and then to the 110 axes, finding out what the strains are, rotating the strains back to the 110 type axes and then comparing the two, and you can find that the shear modulus is, is given by C11 and C112. And uh, the interesting thing is then, as this goes to zero, what would happen? Well, something with zero shear modulus is unstable. The crystal's unstable at that point. It'll just, you push it and it'll just keep going. So this is an expression of the stability of the alloy. It's also an expression of the ideal strength of the alloy, therefore. And this is what uh, Bill Morris and so on, guys in Toyota were very excited about. They published a science paper on this, where they, uh, their model had overestimated the gradient slightly, and they said that this alloy should have a shear modulus of zero. Experimentally, it's actually here, um, which puts it on the line with other titanium alloys. Um, and that's very, very nice. Um, so here we have a... Uh, a way of thinking about what the ideal shear strength of an alloy would be, uh, or the stability of a phase would be, as a function of uh, alloying. And as you uh, come down to these relatively unstable alloys, you see, in fact, that they do 
tend to form other phases, and there's an alpha prime orthorhombic Martin site, but they tend to form very easily. They form b twins by shearing very easily. Lots of interesting mechanical behavior arises. Um, another thing where the elastic moduli come on are what's called phonons. And uh, phonons are, uh, are important um, uh, in alloys. And if you were doing solid state physics in second year, you would study this book, um, Kittel, Introduction to Solid State Physics, and uh, one chapter of which is on phonons. And uh, think about phonons, define what phonons are. Think of a, a series of atoms separated by a series of atomic springs, the bonds. Um, and then we can do uh, a second order differential equation, like we did in first year maths. So if I have an atom here and I tweak it across a little bit, the restoring force, if it's a spring, with a stiffness constant k, or sorry, stiffness constant c, will be given by its relative displacement. If this is a, an atom u i, um, then it'll be given by the displacement here between u i and u i plus one. So that's that displacement. Um, that will give you a force that pushes it back that way. And if it's between u i and u i minus one, if it stretches, that'll also give you a force that way. And if that's stretched that way, you'll get another force there. So that's the force acting on this atom when we've displaced it a little bit. Um, and its position is given here by u, of course. Then we can say, well, f is ma. OK, let's take Newton's laws, uh, like we did in school. So m times a, the rate of change of u with t squared, um, will be given by f the force, so this equation. And this is a separable second order differential equation, right? Which we can solve just like we did in A level um, or in first year. And it will have solutions A e to the i omega t. Um, and we can say that uh, the acceleration will be minus omega squared times u. Um, and so we find that uh, minus m omega squared u is equal to um, this expression. And I've just rearranged this to uh, take out the, the, the ui's as combine them together. And omega, of course, is the frequency of a vibrational mode. So if we had a standing wave, a series of springs, we could have a standing wave like a guitar string. Of course, that would be uh, a transverse wave. Um, if it was in plane, it would be a longitudinal wave. We could have two sorts of waves. Um, and uh, this omega would be the catch. There might be some characteristic frequencies depending on the stiffness constant and the mass only of the, uh, well the, and the atomic spacing. Um, so those would be the only uh, components of the system. So the stiffness constant then becomes very important. M is like the damper. Uh, the atomic spacing is the spacing spring. Um, and that frequency uh, would then be very interesting. Um, and uh, what we would find um, is that uh, actually materials with at some temperature would naturally sit having these vibrational modes in them. They're all, all the atoms are vibrating at characteristic frequencies. Those characteristic frequencies are in the terahertz, and it turns out that we can measure them. So um, if we plot how omega varies as we change the orientation of the crystal, this is going around the Brillouin zone that you met in solid state physics, the zero points here are the elastic scattering planes. Um, and uh, then the vibrational mode gets increasingly um, strong as you go away from them and to midway between the Brillouin zones. And it turns out we can measure these by uh, neutron scattering. Um, that is, we can go and look at if we put, if we come along at this orientation and we put in a neutron beam of a given energy, if we go and measure the outgoing beam at some energy loss, we would measure a peak corresponding to the vibrational frequency. If we did it here, we'd find a peak corresponding to that vibrational frequency or that energy of the vibrational mode. So we can go and measure what the phonon spectrum looks like. Um, here's an example from Patry from BCC Zirconium. Um, for different vibrational modes. This is going around the 111 zone, the 001 zone, the 110 zone, the 112 zone in BCC Zerk um, in a single crystal at 1200 degrees C. 
um, hero experiment of the ILL in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. And uh, these are the transverse modes and the longitudinal modes. So the freak going that way, or the guitar string going that way, uh, that way is transverse, that way is longitudinal, as you go around the Brüllian zones. Um, and what you see here is that for this mode here, this longitudinal mode, rather than doing this, which is what it should do, there is a depression in the phonon spectrum at close to, not quite, actually at 111. And that's uh, very interesting. Um, what it uh, we'll come on to it when we look at titanium, but that corresponds to a vulnerability to form the omega phase. That is, there's a phase that it can shear into um, where two of the atoms that are on different planes, this is a very soft mode, so they're vibrating up and down a lot, and they vibrate and stick in a new phase called the omega phase, and that means this energy, uh, this mode has a, a, a low energy. And this uh, has a consequence that it, it helps you explain why uh, BCC Zerk has a... Sorry about that. So, um, so in omega, in, in zirconium, you have this phenomena where you can easily form um, the, um, uh, the omega phase because of this phonon. This also helps explain uh, why the thermal diffusion in BCC zirconium is anomalously high. Um, and uh, that's... Uh, I'm not expecting you to really get involved in this. I'm just sh showing you that there is a relationship between the fundamental metal physics um, and uh, that we can measure, and the phases that form, and the phase stability. So um, I have a colleague who's been doing this for some BCC titanium alloys that are vulnerable to a, a shear transformation on the 112 axis to the alpha, alpha prime phase, and that results in this mode here, this T1 mode, being very low in energy uh, in a similar sort of way. Um, the other thing uh, that I, I guess is interesting here is Whenever we've talked about entropy before, we've always talked about configurational entropy. Now, the vibrational modes are another source of energy in the system. They're another entropy contribution. And in some circumstances, for some systems, um, I think vanadium dioxide is one, um, then uh, the entropy can, uh, that entropy can be a big stabilizer of a particular phase. So there are also situations where this is worth considering in the metal physics. Um, and the, the attractive thing here is all of these things, the phonon spectrum, the elastic constants, um, uh, the lattice parameters are in principle accessible to metal physics models, d uh, density functional theory models. And therefore, density functional theory models are now getting to the point where they can help us have ideas about how alloying works. Um, they're not all the way there to a full prediction, you know, don't believe the sales hype, but they are moving along to be helpful to us. Another thing I briefly want to talk about are Blackman diagrams. Uh, this is a, a Blackman diagram showing uh, a whole bunch of different uh, metals. Um, and a Blackman diagram plots uh, the relationship between the elastic constants in the following way. So uh, a, a cubic crystal, these are all cubic crystals, has uh, three elastic constants, C11, C12, uh, which both relate to the normal s strains and stresses, and C44 that relates to the 100 shear modulus. And if you plot the ratio between C12 and C11 on this axis against the ratio between C44 and C11 on this axis, you get the following plot. And uh, there are a bunch of interesting things about this plot, so let's just uh, think about uh, a few things for a moment. We've already talked about C prime, which is the 110 shear modulus. And if that's negative, the crystal will be unstable, which Zena said in the 30s. Um, and that is, if C11, as it approaches C12, or C12 becomes big enough to be nearly C11, then this crystal will be becoming less and less stable. Um, there's, uh, then, if that's the shear modulus on the 110, 110 planes, C44 is the 100, 100 shear modulus. The ratio between them, we call the elastic anisotropy, big A. Um, and something that was shear isotropic would have the same value as C44 and C prime. Um, if C11 was equal to C12, then the crystal would be unstable in compression. Um, that is, uh, when you compressed it, um, uh, 
then you would have uh, zero modulus, that is, it would um, flop all over the place. So that's, a, according to Born, that's a melting criteria. Um, so as you heat something up, if it transformed straight to a liquid with uh, no growth of liquid phase, there are some conditions, then uh, you might find that, that, uh, that C12 approaches C11, um, which is sort of similar to this statement. Um, the other one is C12 and C44, if you take the ratio of them, then uh, if it's greater than one, you would have non-directional bonding, and if it's less than one, you'd have directional bonding, and one would be ideal, it's called the Corti pressure. Um, and what you tend to find is that if it's less than one, then the metals are found to be intrinsically brittle, because shear is easy compared to hydrolytic compression. It takes some time, probably a whole lecture, to go through and prove all these to you, um, so take my word for it. But um, actually, in the, uh, on the web page, you'll find a link to a nice paper by Ledbetter that goes through this in a bit more detail. But again, annoyingly, he doesn't really um, show it to you. But you can show it to yourself if you, if you try hard. So let's come back to our Blackman diagram. This is our uh, Corti pressure, um, and uh, where C120 C44 is equal to 1. Here... Uh, C4 uh, here, up here, this is the line where C12 over C11 is 1. That is where it becomes unstable. So your alkali metals, things that are close up here, these guys, they are uh, close to being unstable. Um, then uh, we have some other lines. These lines are the Poisson's ratio. As the Poisson's ratio uh, goes up, so these things here have a negative Poisson's ratio, that's unstable, so there aren't anything up here. Um, this is a Poisson's ratio of 0.3, that's very typical. Um, and uh, there's a, a couple of other lines as well to think about. Um, and uh, the other thing is, as we go around here, as we go from the here to here to here, this is the anisotropy ratio. This is A, C44 over C prime. So this is uh, uh, one, um, this is a half, two, three, and so on. And so you tend to find that uh, a lot of things cluster on this line um, here. And if you go and plot these for different types of thing, uh, of compounds, for carbides, uh, for ceramics, you find they're in different parts of the diagram, which helps you explain why they are brittle or not brittle, and so on and so forth. Um, so um, here we've got uh, uh, our, our dotted lines coming from the top left. That's the anisotropy ratio. The curved lines are the Poisson's ratio. Uh, and here, up here, as we approach one, we're things that are can easily shear into another structure. Um, and that gives us our, our range of, uh, of behaviors. Um, and so Blackman diagrams or uh, related other diagrams plotting uh, AP, things like APB energy in relation to the elastic constants can be quite a useful way of thinking about the stability of crystals and how they behave. Um, and you can see that you change them as you alloy, for instance, for uh, nickel cobalt alloys. Um, and uh, I guess the other comment I would say is because the elastic moduli are involved in the energy of dislocations, um, including their dissociation into partials, the, uh, the APB energies, we can expect that they also have a role to play in things like the flow stress anomaly in uh, into metallics. Um, that is, uh, Nick Ni3L, uh, among others, um, some of the L12 into metallics um, show an increase in strength until there's a dissociation due to thermal um, activation um, with temperature. Most metals strength decreases with temperature. The amazing thing about Ni3L is its strength increases with temperature which is called the yield stress anomaly, which you'll study in, in the nickel superalloys lectures. And um, those come back to these sorts of things, the elastic moduli, the energies of the, of the partials. And that's important. So these are, as I said, these are uh, uh, things that are amenable to theory that are predictable from theory. So uh, things like density functional theory can probably help us to design better alloys. So in summary, in this lecture on alloying, uh, we've looked at the hume rothery rules um, and predicting how solutions might exist. Uh, we've looked at intermetallic precipitates and 
what they are, two interpenetrating or three interpen inter interpenetrating lattices, um, and that they are related to things like ordering. Uh, they're also related to things like spinosal decomposition. Um, uh, we've examined the role of misfit strains more generally, and that led us into an interesting little side alley on uh, shape memory alloys. Um, and then we've looked at phonons um, to really get into metal physics. Um, and then we've looked at elastic constants and their role in stability. As I say, I'm not um, this is probably intellectually the hardest work in the whole course, um, and I don't expect to examine this in uh, very hard, uh, but it's giving you some scene setting for the conversations we'll have on alloying from a theoretical perspective. So I'll see you next time for the lectures on titanium.